Good morning, everyone, and welcome back. First, I'd like to acknowledge and thank the following organizations for their support and sponsorship for this morning's breakfast. Alaska Seafood Marketing Institute, Chobani, and Custom Culinary. Thank you to those wonderful supporters. I'm Kathy Joran, the Senior Director of the School of Graduate and Professional Studies and the Food Business School here at the CIA. And I have the pleasure of giving you a brief update on our master's degree program offerings. Before I tell you about these programs, here are a couple of housekeeping items related to today's summit experience. First is a reminder that the presentations and demonstration recipes and other resources are available on your conference program app and on the website. Today's programming includes topics around plant-forward and plant-based foods and associated science and technology, cultural diversity, food justice, climate change action through food, culinary training, delicious food for health, and more. This morning's schedule includes three general sessions and our second round of breakout sessions taking place in various locations. And as with yesterday, staff will be strategically positioned to direct you to those locations. At the conclusion of the breakout sessions, bento box lunches will be available for you to pick up at the Beverage Garden Plaza, which is where the reception was last night. And uh, then desserts will be available on the lobby level and the lower level here in this building. The day will conclude, uh, sorry, then there'll be two afternoon general sessions here in this room and the day will conclude with another reception at the Beverage Garden Plaza. Another full day of learning. Now to the CIA's master programs. I'm pleased to announce that through the business school, the Food Business School, and the Culinary Institute of America's School of Graduate and Professional Studies, we are now offering four different master's degree programs, along with our accelerated culinary arts certificate program. All of our master's degree programs are 30 to 36 credit master professional studies degrees with a combined emphasis on academics and practical experience. Each program is cohort based, two years long, and primarily online with two to three short residencies typically based at CIA campuses. They're all designed as executive type programs for working professionals who want to earn an advanced degree from their desired location while continuing their work and family lives. All programs culminate with the development and presentation of a capstone project which is intended to have a positive impact on our food system. Our first master's degree launched in the fall of 2018 with a focus on food business. This program is a one-of-a-kind business degree, sorry, With an excellent, which, which is an excellent fit for professionals who endeavor to shape the food industry through uh, business opportunities, either entrepreneurial or intrapreneurial. Hallmarks of the program include the choice of one of three tracks for the second year of study, with a focus on either restaurant, uh, restaurant food service operations, food product launch into the retail market, or general uh, management strategies. And the other hallmark of this program is that it's primarily taught by practicing industry professionals. Cohort four of the program will graduate this August. We'll admit cohort six in fall of 2023. And cohort five is here this week attending their second residency, which includes participation in this summit. You all know how influential this summit is, so it won't surprise you that master's students in previous cohorts who've attended this summit have told me afterwards that they needed to significantly update their business concepts after attending conference sessions. To highlight, current students and graduate comments include, from Athera, CIA completely changed my life, gave me confidence and belief in many potential opportunities. Chef Michael Hornback, who's a sh uh, chef of Custom Culinary, who's here today, says, I returned to CIA to get my master's degree in order to become a leader in the transformation of the global food system towards a healthier planet. Teo notes that the program has opened my eyes to new ideas and new ways of thinking. 
Doug says CI provides a portal to view the future of food. And Judy, a food photographer, states that I applied my lessons in business and doubled my income. An a second Master of Professional Studies has evolved from the Beverage Graduate Certificate Program that we delivered in Napa Valley for several years. The current Master's in Wine and Beverage Management is a unique Master's degree that not only takes you from vine to bottle, but also emphasizes how wine makes, it, makes its way to the table, covering the life cycle of a bottle from marketing to distribution and from restaurants to retail. This is a perfect degree for people looking to add beverage specialization to their credentials, for current beverage professionals looking to advance, or for people who want to indulge their passion for wine and beverages in a potential career change. Our inaugural online cohort will graduate in August. The second cohort has just completed their first year, and we will welcome the third cohort in September. The program includes a number of beverage-focused business courses, along with extensive tastings, facilitated through our residencies and through a special partnership with a company called Master the World, which creates custom culinary, uh, sorry, customized tasting kits that we ship directly to the students in, in their home or office. Students of this program are saying, the program gave me the opportunity to change my career in a way that I never thought possible or online classes allowed me to maintain my career while furthering my education and I'm applying this new knowledge directly to my job. Our third master's program is a master's in sustainable food systems, which started last fall. Current and future leaders committed to guiding organizations in the future in terms of sustainability in the world of food are a perfect fit for this program. These learners who think these are learners who think about careers in agriculture, supply chain, advocacy, policy, education, and corporate sustainability program management. The CIA is uniquely qualified to deliver this program with a focus on sustainability in our food system through a culinary lens. The design of the program benefits from the expertise of an external advisory council of experienced industry leaders, a number of which, a number of whom are, are attending here. Also pertinent to this program as, is that it's supported in part by the CI's relationship with Google. The first cohort of this program is also attending the conference today as part of their second residency. You can hear a bit more about these programs from a a uh, short video that I'm going to play for you now. I'm really interested in more of the, the business side of food. My classes have covered everything from best business practices to creative design thinking where we really have to think outside of the box. The world has changed. The world of hospitality has changed, restaurants and, and food products has changed dramatically. We can prepare you for that. Our students in this program will be studying a very large range of courses. It's comprehensive studies of the beverage world, from viticulture and viniculture, food and wine pairing. They'll also study business operations, restaurant, hotel, a global market overview of the entire beverage and hospitality world. And this course in particular sets students um, ahead for getting ready for what's out there after they graduate. So in the Sustainable Food Systems Master's Program, students study a wide range of topics related to food and sustainability. And we're training thinkers that are able to integrate information about uh, food systems topics and ideas and to be able to think more deeply about what a food system is and how we might be able to uh, make change. One of the things that we see within food systems is the discipline is quickly changing and emerging and defining itself. There are jobs in the food system, lots of jobs in the food system that weren't there um, two years ago, five years ago. And I think that's really an exciting space to be in for our graduates. It's amazing what kind of doors open when you take this program.
Now I want to announce the launch of our newest program, a first of its kind in the US, the master's degree in culinary arts. This program is selective and will be launched this fall for an intimate cohort of experienced chefs who want to take their passion, creativity, commitment, and vision for the future of the culinary profession to a new level by taking a deep dive into what it takes to run a great restaurant. Different from our other programs, this one includes a two-year required and paid internship at selected Michelin-starred restaurants, and it's also supported with scholarships from Dom Perignon. More to come about that one. Now I'd like to ask the master's students in food business and in sustainable food systems who are here today to quickly stand up and be acknowledged. We're so proud of them and look forward to the impacts they'll make in their future endeavors. All right, thank you for allowing me to share these continuing new developments that exemplify the CIA's commitment to advancing education for future industry leaders. I encourage you all to consider joining one of our programs or referring your colleagues to join and hope that you can generally spread the word to your networks of professionals who would benefit from being a part of impacting future change in our industry. We're currently still accepting applications for all programs for fall 2023, and you can find more information at masters.culinary.edu. Now is my pleasure to introduce general session four, ta uh, tackling cl climate change through food, global trends, and call to action. Our presenter is Anne Bordier, Director of Sustainable Diets at the World Resources Institute. Through her work in the food industry, Anne has a deep understanding of how the food systems operate and the challenges it faces. She leads World Resources Institute's work program on sustainable diets, which focuses on shifting consumption towards climate-friendly and nutritious food. Through Cool Food, a movement for delicious climate action, WRI leverages the scale and consumer reach of large institutions to serve millions of climate-friendly meals each day and empowers consumers to choose plant-rich diets. Please welcome Anne to the stage and thank you. Good morning. Well, I really want to go back to school today. I have to say the wine and beverage program is, uh, is probably the one for me. <laughs> I'm really delighted to be here this morning to represent the Sustainable Diets team at World Resources Institute. I want to share with you some of the global trends we are seeing in terms of tackling climate change through food and also share with you some of our thoughts on the challenges and opportunities out there. If you don't know about World Resources Institute, we are an international not-for-profit research organization that focuses on turning big, uh, big ideas into action at the nexus of environment, economic development, and human well-being. And of course, the link between food and climate is one of those challenges. So to start with, let's take a step back. And I think all of us are very familiar with this chart. We all know it is not going in the right direction. And I think in the last couple of months, scientists, scientists have also told us that we are likely to overshoot the 1.5 degree threshold in the next five years. So we are really in a crisis. We really need to step up our action. I think all of us here know that livestock farming, particularly beef and lamb, is the third contributor to global greenhouse gas emissions. And within this, um, ruminant, uh, ruminant meat, uh, uh, beef and lamb, takes the lion's share. So, and, and is a key driver of deforestation. So one of the indicators we track 
is the average per capita ruminant meat consumption in high consuming regions. And we do this because we know that shifting consumption in high consuming countries towards low carbon plant rich food is a key lever to make our global food system more equitable and more sustainable. So you can see on the chart, uh, ruminant meat consumption is decreasing, but it is not decreasing fast enough. So we need to go faster. You know, we need to do a better job at driving this change. And I have to say, I feel very hopeful that this is possible. And the reason I say that is that there are a number of global trends that you know, make me think you know, we can be hopeful, that we can drive this change. The first one is we know consumers are telling us they want food that is nutritious, healthy, and sustainable. And we heard from Marie yesterday that there is a real appetite for change in the US. It's very aligned with the data we are also seeing. So we know also a lot of people identify as meat eaters. There is a very significant proportion who want to reduce their meat consumption. And that's particularly true in Europe. In fact, the European Investment Bank last year did a study and they found that um, two thirds of Europeans were in favor for government measures to help them change their behavior to tackle climate change. And one in eight Europeans want to see all food products labeled with their climate footprint. But we also know that intent doesn't convert into action, and that consumers are confused, and that they need our help to make better choices. The second trend that is giving me a lot of hope is that we are seeing some great leadership from some food providers. More and more companies are now making very public commitments to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions relating with the food they serve, and are also committing to changing their offer. And of course, many of you are here today, so thank you for that. It's not just corporates that are leading the charge. I hope you've heard this, uh, this week from the Menus of Change University Research Collaborative and from Healthcare Without Harm. They share our ambition to reduce the climate impact of food. And they are driving very, you know, doing some very interesting projects and driving real change in their own sectors. And we're also seeing some great leadership from some of the world's biggest cities. You probably know that Mayor Adams in New York is a real champion for all New Yorkers to eat healthier and more sustainable food. And the city has just announced that they want to go faster and further in reducing the climate impact of the food they serve. And they've actually called on all food businesses in the city to follow their lead. The third global trend I wanted to touch, off, to touch on is policy. I think we all know that national governments are probably not doing enough to drive this agenda. But again, we are seeing some signs of progress. Last year, some of us attended the first ever food system pavilion at the COP27 climate conference. It was very interesting for me yesterday to attend the breakout session that talked about the changing policy environment in the US. And it sounds like there's a real window of opportunity for you know, some good things to happen. In Europe, the, the European Union, Union is about to launch a proposal for a new food sustainable system law. And if that goes through, it could pave the way for a raft of new, very progressive legislation for its 27 member, member states. And in China, we are also seeing the government there re reconsider the role of dietary habits to secure future food resilience. So in this context, how do we move forward? Through our initiative Cool Food, we now work with 70 food providers 
that serve altogether about 8 billion meals a year. They are united in their ambition and their commitment to reduce the climate impact of the food they serve by at least 25%, which is in line with the goals of the Paris Agreement. So what we do through Cool Food is we help them measure their footprint, track progress, and critically take action by shifting demand towards low-carbon, plant-rich diets. When we first launched Cool Food, we wanted to create behavior change at scale by leveraging the creativity and the reach of your sector, because we wanted to make it possible for millions of people to, have, to be able to enjoy uh, delicious but also climate-friendly food every day. And what we've learned in those four years is that small changes can have a really big impact. In fact, the early adopters of our Cool Food Pledge have already reduced their per plate greenhouse gas emissions by 21% since they joined the program. So they are well on track to deliver on their commitments. But of course, we don't want to stop here. We know we have a lot more work to do. And we also know it's not easy. There are many challenges to, to create this change. But of course, from those challenges come many opportunities, and that's really where we want to focus our efforts next. So the first challenge is data. We know it's difficult to calculate scope three greenhouse gas emissions. We know it's hard to collate data upstream in the supply chain. And we know it can be difficult to calculate the carbon footprint at a RCP level. But it's really important we persevere here, because as we all know, what gets measured gets done. And of course, transparency is critical to drive trust with your customers, with your shareholders, and with us NGOs. So, the reason, uh, so, and, and what we've also learned from Cool Food is that it's okay to start with imperfect data, as long as your methodology is very robust and that it's underpinned by very rigor rigorous standards. So that's the reason why we launched the Cool Food Calculator. It's been designed especially for the food service sector, and you can find it on our website. But the science continues to evolve, so we need to continue to refine it. And um, one of the, we, we get many questions about, uh, for example, the environmental impact of different meat production systems. So that's one area we want to do more work on. There are a lot of different views on this within the scientific community, and we know it's difficult to navigate in industry because it's full of complicated trade-offs, and getting on-farm data is difficult. So we're about to launch some new research in this area, but we know we want to go further. And if, you if there are questions you have or there are things you would like us to look at, do get in touch, because it'd be really useful to get your input as we, sc we scope our next steps. The second area we know is challenges is in how do you continue to delight your guests as you re-engineer your food offer. As you can hear, I'm from France, and I love food. And I've really enjoyed tasting some new plant-rich dishes this week. So I feel really confident with so much creativity and so much effort um, going into training you know, new skills to develop plant-forward dishes. We can make uh, climate-friendly food really, really delicious. There's another tool we can use, and that's behavioral science, or behavior change techniques. At WRI, we believe it's a really untapped lever to help us address the climate crisis. So let's just be clear, we're not talking here about relying on the individual actions or relying on consumers to get, at, get us out of this crisis. What we're talking about is being very intentional in introducing uh, proven, scientifically proven behavior change strategies, which we know uh, work in shifting consumption towards um, uh, climate-friendly food, sometimes, in, sometimes unconsciously, 
and doing this in, in practice in dining environments. So this could be changing the dish itself, or what it's called, or indeed how it's presented on a counter. We call this our 6P behavior change framework. There's a lot of uh, fantastic academic research out there that can give us some really great ideas of what can be done. So for example, last year we did a study where we tested the impact of different climate messages on a menu. And we found that some of the messages doubled the number of vegetarian options that people ordered. So that's an example of a great technique we could, you know, we, we could adopt more widely. So what we want to do with school food now is you know, really get this research into the real world and develop very actionable insights and tools you can use to utilize it in your own settings. And for those of you who are joining the second breakout today, you'll be able to hear more uh, about this from uh, my colleague Edwina and some of our members. The final challenge I wanted to touch on is that we know it can be hard to win hearts and minds, both internally and externally. Change is hard, especially in large organizations. So it's really critical to convey the importance of tackling the, impact, the, the climate impact of food, explain how to go about it, and then put in place uh, new ways of doing things for the long term. Big conferences like this are great because they, can re they really help keep this topic top of mind and really shine a light on the, the need for change. But we know that to deliver change, we need more targeted interventions. So we want to play our part here, and we are developing new workshops and new online tools to help organizations do just that. Externally, we believe there are many opportunities to engage your diners in delicious climate action. So that's why we launched this badge. And you know, this was very much designed to help people identify quickly a low-carbon dish on a menu. We are delighted that Panera, our, um, you know, that this, this the cool food label, as we call it, plays a key role in Panera's strategy and that's part of their offer. And we are also delighted that Aramark have decided to roll it out across their entire North American estate. We are also working with Nestle Professional to raise the profile of this label in the restaurant sector. And we would love it if more of you would join us to get this label out there and make it easier for more people to make uh, climate-friendly choices. So to finish with, I would like to leave you with one message. We need to go faster, and we all need to step up. So no matter what your role is or where you are on the journey, there is something you can do. And if you are not sure where to start or if we can help in any way, do get in touch. Because now, more than ever, we need to accelerate the movement for delicious climate action. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne. Good morning, everyone. I hope you all enjoyed your evenings last night in the Hudson Valley, and nice to see you all back for day two. It is my pleasure to introduce the uh, moderator for the next session here on Building a Better Burger. Dr. Beth Forrest is Professor of Liberal Arts and Applied Food Studies here at the CIA, and she teaches a variety of courses in food history and world cuisines and cultures. She's a former president of the Association of the Study of Food and Society and a principal investigator of a large funded, uh, grant funded project, Food Studies, Race and the Humanities. She's a co-editor of two books and has published on a range of super fascinating topics on everything from 
how Americans have imagined eating in hell, to how Americans have framed Spanish identity through rancid olive oil, and to how eating chocolate in early modern Spain was tied to Catholic theology and sin. So we invited uh, Dr. Beth Forrest to provide a bit of a historical and cultural grounding in the role that the hamburger plays in American foodways before we then open up to a broader panel of chefs and operators to give you a sense of all of the complex decisions at play when menuing a better burger. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Beth Forrest. Where's the clicker? It's just the... Okay. Good morning. 50 billion burgers. 50 billion. Um, at the height of consumption, around 2011, that was how many burgers were consumed in the United States. That's an average of three burgers each week by each American consumer. Um, around 2022, it's dipped down to about 60 burgers a week. According to the BBC, the Times of India, World Atlas, and an array of other media outlets from Smithsonian Magazine to footballlovers.com, as well as my students here at the CIA, the, uh, the hamburger is the national dish of the United States of, of America, even overtaking apple pie. But what is striking about this declaration is that although our nation was created in 1776, the hamburger, as we know it, was a much later invention. It has a contested history. In 1763, English one, uh, woman Hannah Glass, in her cookbook, Art of Cookery Made Plain and Easy, included a Hamburg sausage recipe made from minced beef and suet uh, and replete with pepper, cloves, nutmeg, garlic, red wine, and rum. Um, but this is a far cry from what's gobbled down on the 4th of July. Salisbury or hamburger steaks, likewise, were more akin to a personal meatloaf, and notably, they're missing the other key ingredient, the bun. Who, when, and where this dish was uh, created is debated. Some say Jewish immigrants who traveled from Hamburg, Germany to New York uh, in the second half of the 19th century. Some would argue Louis Lassen in New Haven in 1895. Charlie Nagreen at the Seymour Country Fair in Wisconsin in 1885. Uh, Frank and Charles um, Menches at the Airy Country Fair in New York in 1885. And there's others in Texas, etc. Despite this, it is in the 20th century when the hamburger as we know it became popular. And I looked at um, uh, Google uh, mgrams of books published in the 20th century, and it steadily rose from 1900 to 1940, and again from 1960 until its peak in 2011. There are regional differences of hamburger, yet no region can claim it. And I will argue that that's one of the three reasons why I think hamburger has become the national dish. Right? Um, the second reason that we can look at is it fits into our entrenched cuisine that goes back much further. And again, we're talking about, if you will, the dominant hege hegemonic cuisine in the United States. One, uh, uh, staple foods, wheat and beef, which have long been the status symbol going back to European roots. Second, flavor principle. In America, we like three things, and I'm guessing you can already uh, imagine what they are. Sweet, salty, fatty. And we get that from the beer burger as well as, of course, the ketchup, the number one condiment in the United States up until the mid-90s. Three, it represents the idealized nuclear family. And this became particularly important in the post-war years. First, grilled meat, masculine, ideal being close to nature, versus baked bread, which is uh, the domestic sign of femininity. Four, manners. Informal, unfussy, eaten with our hands. We can walk around, we can drive, we can do anything while eating a hamburger. It's remarkable. And five, it also fits into our, uh, well, I think you would all say very problematic commodity chain, which is very long and large. The sec uh, third reason, 
that hamburger fits into the American national culture, um, I would like to argue goes back to a theory um, coined by uh, Frederick Jackson in 1893 called the Frontier uh, Thesis. And what he argues is that it was the unsettled American frontier that really um, caused American and American culture to break from much more traditional European um, traditions. And, and as so, we have created our own unique American culture, and of course, cuisine is a reflection of that culture. Right? So going down, democracy and equality. Hamburgers are relatively inexpensive, readily available, and um, a vast majority of Americans can participate in their consumption. Next, hamburgers are the antithesis, I think we can say, of an elite culture. They are casual, fast, and can be unpretentious. Next, to quote Burger King, you can have it your way. Right? And um, burgers are easily personalized to fit each individual preference, again highlighting our real em emphasis on individuality and freedom and personal choice in the United States. And finally, they are the very embodiment of ingenuity. From some claims that the hamburger was invented when a cook ran out of certain ingredients to certain guests not wanting to get their hands dirty so they stuck it between some bread, um, to Ray Kroc marketing burgers to busy workers who needed cheap and fast food. There has always been this connection of invention, reinvention, and problem solving. And it's with this last point that I would like to introduce today's panelists. Right? For if, I would like to say, if we can invent a better national dish in America, the burger, we can build a better food system. First up, we have Spike Mendelson. He's co-founder and chef of Eat the Change, a company to create foods that are environmentally friendly, healthy, tasty, or as Spike said in one interview, quote, plant-based indulgent food. This includes the chain Plant Burger with 14 locations, many of which are found in uh, Whole Food markets, but also brick and mortar in New York. He serves as the first chairperson of DC's Food Policy Council, a coalition of public and government food leaders to create a just, healthy, and food system, in addition to a host of other organizations that serve to educate and change policy. Next, Fiore uh, Mullets. He is chef and co-founder of Burgers Brewing in Pittsburgh, PA, an award-winning uh, restaurant that sources all ingredients within 200 miles of the restaurant. He also focuses on ethical and sustainable practices, not only for ingredients and guests, but also for his employees. In 2018, the blended burger that he created won a James Beard Award uh, beating out 350 other competitors. Next, we have Matthew Ward, an executive chef and residential dining, uh, res executive chef of residential dining at the University of North Texas in Dallas. Beginning in uh, 2017, he started his tenure there when he oversaw Mean Greens Cafe, the very first uh, and 100% plant-based dining hall at a college campus. And this includes a hydroponic freight farm. And it has won accolades from a, an array of stakeholders, including um, PETA as well as industry um, publications. He currently serves as co-chair of the Executive Chef Committee of the Menu of Change Research uh, University Research Collaborative. And finally, I'd like to introduce Pam Smith, nutritionist and innovator who has been a culinary consultant to a number of well-known companies, including Disney, Nike, Boeing, Darden Restaurant Group, among others. She has authored 17 books. Make me look lazy. Thank you. And you can find her across numerous media platforms where she hosts live cooking classes and workshops. So I'll pass the mic over to Pam. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you, Beth. That was actually so fascinating and entertaining because you are sitting here today with us talking about how do you take this classic American burger and reimagine it 
to a better burger? How do you move the needle on a world that is so in need of um, making food choices that are going to make not only the healthy difference, healthy for the body, healthy for the planet. And that's exactly what we're here to do today. Um, I love the statistic um, that, again, the average American eats three burgers a week. And 71% of all beef used commercially is in the form of burgers and cheeseburgers. So if we're gonna make a difference, the burger, I think it's a really good place to start. Um, I had that slide on the Healthy Menus R&D Collaborative. I have the honor, the blessing of co-chairing the Healthy Menus R&D Collaborative. If you're not familiar with it, it's a strategic initiative of the Culinary Institute of America. We started back in 2010 with an idea that could companies, large volume food service companies and brands come together not to discuss a particular topic, but instead to collaborate on finding tasty solutions for this ever-changing appetite. And we discovered that yes, even though in very competitive environments, um, rather than the arms crossed, instead, there was this willingness to get into the trenches together and try to really not only identify solutions, but put them into work, make them operationally doable, and in the process of that, hopefully start to move the needle. Um, we have brands that come to us from every sector working together. We have fast food QSR, we have fast casual and casual dining, family dining, a large group of non-commercial as well from colleges and universities covering the spectrum of food service. And again, with all of those incredible brands that are working together, we have an opportunity to really see some magic take place place. As a matter of fact, all of those volume food service operators together serve 38 million meals a day. 38 million meals a day. We're calculating that again to see if that's gone up. But 38 million meals, that means that even small changes can make huge impact. And it's those small changes that we're working on every day. We came together initially to try to tackle something that was very big in our industry. It was um, sodium reduction. In 2010, the Institute of Medicine had come out with a report and restaurants, food service, was being quite vilified as maybe being the demon behind the public health crisis with sodium, hypertension, stroke, cardiovascular disease. We wanted to see if we could, working together and with our huge supply chain opportunity, could make that difference, could make the way clear to be able to have tasting success with lowering salt. We also wanted to work together to increase produce. And it was out of some of those working group sessions that we discovered something quite interesting. It was that we knew that if we could start to swap out some of the animal protein that was being used with produce, with, plant pro with plants um, into that, we would be able to see a change. It was right at the time that beef prices were soaring, beef shortages were ensuing, and sodium reduction needed, all of that sounding very familiar, we're kind of in a back to the future mode right now in 2023. 2011, we were absolutely in the throes of it as well. In one of those working groups, we discovered something called the blend, that we could indeed swap out 25% of beef with chopped mushrooms. And in the process of that, discovered that amazing things could happen, that by doing that swap with all that mushrooms bring to the party, um, the incredible umami, the incredible craveability and unctuousness that comes through mushrooms, particularly when they're combined with meat, 
the incredible ability of bringing juiciness into the party, the textural capability, the forgivability, because it would hold that juiciness. Certainly better nutrition, certainly better sustainability, and because of the need, very favorable cost implications. Beef prices were high then, as they are now. And in the process of that, that swap could have a better value equation. But wait, there's more. We determined that although the blend could be used in tacos and meatloaf and meatballs, uh, shepherd's pie, anything that you might be wanting to use a ground meat option, and that it could be used with any animal protein. Yes, beef, but also lamb, chicken, turkey. It could be used with plant proteins. It could be lentils. Again, whatever the protein was, mushrooms, simply made it better. Better nutrition, better deliciousness, and better sustainability. We decided to attack the burger, the iconic burger. Again, reimagine it as we're talking about today. Healthy Menus R&D Collaborative. As the co-creator, we felt that we needed to get some sensory studies, some scientific studies, which we did through UC Davis, to really be able to get the validation. Would this be a better burger? And we indeed discovered that the guest, the customer, the subject study in that particular situation preferred the blend over a 100% protein offering. And in the process of that, we also discovered that we could lower the sodium because that umami gave so much flavor with less salt. We actually were kind of doing the proverbial bird with, with um, one stone. So it was a pretty interesting thing. We could do it better. And that better meant better for the body, better for people, better for the planet, and better for the palate. Again, that taste bud sensation that you could get through the blend that you couldn't get other ways. Burgers made better. And wow, did it really roll. We were able to see Seasons 52 be the first casual dining restaurant to roll out the blended burger in a variety of ways and absolutely delicious. We saw Cheesecake Factory roll out a turkey blended burger. We saw colleges and universities, Harvard and Yale and UMass picking it up, K-12, adopting it, um, Sodexo, adopting it as their burger because that blended burger made it a better burger. And then the Mushroom Council, the co-creator with the CIA, joined together with the James Beer Project to do the Blended Burger Project, of which Fior was one of our celebrated winners, actually winning and winning and winning, and we appreciate that so much. Um, when we really saw almost the, the scale being tipped in an incredible way with volume was when Sonic rolled out the Slinger. The Slinger is not a burger, it's not a slider, it's a Slinger, but it was a blended burger that rolled across their 3,600 stores. Again, QSR, we were able to see the blended burger, a better burger, really reach scale, and it just doesn't stop. Again, that Sonic Burger gave us really what we needed, an LTO that was repeated three different times because it just was so very delicious and such a crowd favorite. Today, we have, as we've heard from Beth, three operators that have done their own version of a reimagined burger. Again, we're gonna hear from Fior, who um, gave us his blended burger, his winning bigger blended burger, but coming out of his passion and his um, determination that he was going to do a burger concept with a difference. The same from Spike, when he discovered that he wanted to do plant burger. We'll hear from him. And Matt, leading a huge dining operation, doing not just a blended burger, but also doing a plant burger and doing um, a burger. He's from Texas after all. So we'll hear from that all the way through. So we're excited to have conversation. We're excited to hear from each of these gentlemen. And um, we're excited that you're here to be part of that conversation. So Beth, take it over. 
So thank you so much for joining us. Um, first, uh, why burgers? And how did you approach the burger um, in a way that you thought it should be improved? Fjord, would you like to kick it off as a winner? The winner. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I knew a lot about burgers before I heard you speak. I guess I don't know that much. Um, <laughs> we'll work on that, Fior. <laughs> I, um, I opened burgers to sort of change the idea of what a healthy food option could look like. Um, I kind of fell in love with the... Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, I kind of fell in love with the uh, concept of the blended burger competition because we started uh, burgers to create a healthier option um, for, for food that everyone could kind of relate to. When I had the opportunity to compete in that, um, it aligned us, our staff and everything, so well with the concept of how we were uh, kind of aligning us in the community. Um, we opened burgers to essentially serve a healthier food product and we couldn't figure out, uh, I couldn't figure out personally what, what I could do in a small town that would make a difference. Um, and it just turned out that hamburgers was the way to do it. The blended burger competition kind of put us on the map um, and we, like you said, continue to win and win and win. And to be able to give somebody an option um, of a healthy, like a healthy hamburger, I don't know if that sounds normal to anybody, especially if it's meat based, but um, we were able to kind of change the narrative a little bit. And we continued, we sell 35% 30, of our burgers sold at all of our locations um, are either the blend or plant-based. So we are super happy to be a part of this. Um, That's awesome. Change. <laughs> Did you find that indeed it made it better? I mean, do you think the reason you won was because of that umami unctuousness we were talking about? It's 100% better. Um, the mushroom blend that we used really added a depth to the hamburger that uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't get with just meat, frankly. And people, people started loving it. We were already using a locally sourced, uh, grass-fed, grass-finished uh, meat. And this just elevated that to a level that we weren't expecting, frankly. <laughs> Did you market it as a blended burger or was it just the burger? Yeah, we marketed it as the blended burger. It's still on our menu as the blend. Um, it, it has its own uh, healthy burger aspect to it uh, on the menu. And um, sometimes people don't realize that there's a mushroom in the burger. And when they eat it, they um, maybe are afraid of mushrooms and are a little upset that they didn't read the menu correctly. But uh, they ended up loving it and, and coming back for more and more and more. So That's awesome. definitely a better product. Yeah, the blend's a good gateway for people that aren't sure yet they like mushrooms. So. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it works. That's awesome. That's awesome. Spike, could you tell us a bit about your burger and how you approached it? Sure. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, so, I, I mean, listen, you gave a great presentation. Uh, was it 50 billion burgers or something like that? Uh, I mean, that's, that's kind of why I'm in the business and, and why the burger, we can have the uh, largest impact. Uh, um, you know, I grew up eating um, maybe some, like so, some of you, I, I went to fast food restaurants with, uh, you know, some of my fondest me memories were with my grandmother going to McDonald's in, in Montreal. I'm Canadian from Montreal. And, and uh, you know, I grew up in the restaurant business. Um, you know, after uh, culinary school and a bunch of stints in a ton of restaurants, I opened up my first restaurant um, in 2008 in the middle of the recession in Washington, D.C. And uh, that was Good Stuff Eatery, actually. And that is an animal-based uh, burger restaurant. Uh, we have about seven, eight locations of those. And that movement for me about uh, 15 years ago was improving um, the burger offering. Uh, and why that was is that, you know, I saw what McDonald's was doing. As, as you grow older, you find out about the ingredients that they're using. Uh, and, you know, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's, you know, I don't want to come down on McDonald's or everything, but it's not the, the healthiest uh, of offerings. So, uh, I, you know, in 2008, I decided to make my mark on burgers. And what I thought a better burger was, was getting away from uh, these large form uh, farming, right? And uh, sourcing a little bit more sustainable. I was also part of the better burger mm -hmm. uh, thing. I didn't win, you won. Uh, <laughs> someone uh, had to win, Spike. Someone yes. won. I never won any competition show, just to <laughs> put that out there. I got but a fan off. favorite. A I got kicked favorite. off the Top Chef, Iron Chef, all of them. So, um, you know, 
uh, and uh, you know, I went to make my mark in DC in 2008. That's when I opened up Good Stuff Eatery. Along the way, I uh, started getting involved in policy. Uh, I started lobbying on behalf of the Farm Bill. I worked with uh, Michelle Obama on the Let's M uh, Move organization about bettering school lunches and healthier. And, um, and I was getting a lot of support from, the, from staffers in DC and, and policymakers in and, and the business. And I took a step back and, and, and um, was really wanting to kind of own my own uh, uh, advocacy uh, as far as food is concerned. Um, and I met Seth Goldman, uh, uh, you know, uh, former uh, CEO of Honesty and part of Beyond Meat. And he had introduced me. He's the one that actually introduced me to my first ever uh, plant-based burger. It was uh, a Beyond Meat burger. And uh, I took it home. He, he, he didn't realize that my wife was vegan, and, and I cooked it up. And, and uh, I thought what an incredible product it was. I, it was uh, the 1.0 version. It still had a lot of work to do. But I, I thought, wow, like this is such a, an amazing offering. Um, and I had been busy redefining uh, fast casual, which is a term that was adopted about 10 years ago. And I think what the fast casual is, is, is about making food in your restaurant, right? It's not just about uh, the supply chain and just ordering. It's about really coming up with the recipes in your restaurants. Um, but when I was introduced to the Beyond Burger, I had a vision um, of being able to revolutionize uh, the way we eat fast food, right? Not fast casual concept, but really getting right down there to fast food. And the reason why that was is about all the policy work I've been doing about the education and about how we should be incorporating more plant-based foods in our diets. And I said, listen, if I can make a burger, this burger category, which everyone loves, it's a global menu item, right? Uh, uh, if I can make it uh, better for the planet, better for you, um, and just as delicious and indulgent, um, we'd have a win, and, right. and uh, that's exactly what we did. You know, I, I started, I called it the Burger Palooza. I, I threw a Burger Palooza <laughs> for the executives of Beyond Meat and, and Seth, and, and uh, where we basically just swapped, uh, you know, animal meat for plant-based meats in all my burger setups at my restaurant. Uh, and sure enough, um, you know, these ingredients were, were, were amazing. And, and that was the other thing. There was, you know, I, I'd say, Let's say about 10 years ago, I don't think I could do what, I, what we're doing, right? Uh, five years ago, I think a lot of these ingredients started to hit the market, right? So you could find a plant-based cheese that actually melts and feels indulgent and encapsulates all the rest of the ingredients. There is the Beyond Meat along with other ones. Um, there is Oatly. We, use, we make milkshakes, you know? So if, if I could come up with the entire burger concept from shakes to fries to chili and just 100% make it plant-based, I thought there was a, a winning proposition there. And then furthermore, uh, just uh, to finish it off, is, you know, one of our, you know, we do look at climate change at the resolve, the resolve of it through our food system. It's right. the single biggest change you can have um, is your own personal environmental footprint, right? And I'm a flexitarian, I'm not 100% vegan or vegetarian, but I, d I have learned along the way that balance is key, right? And, and uh, so that's kind of the way we look at the movement. And the other thing is, is democratizing plant-based foods, right? We, we can only have a massive change if we make these things affordable to all. And that's why I lean into uh, plant burger is a fast food concept. It's not a fast casual concept because it's defined by its supply chain um, and its price point. So uh, mm -hmm. that's that's why I'm in burgers and and yeah, we have 14 locations and and it's it's going well so far. So I love that and expanding the menu as you go. Yes, you, you know we we you know and, uh, I want to get to the rest of the palace, but we have a ton of innovation at Plant Burger and and that's what's so exciting about this movement and and even these conferences here that we're having is that. We're really um, seeing a shift. We are experiencing a shift in our food system, uh, a renaissance, if you will. And I think this, you know, we'll look back 50 years, uh, you know, from now to, you know, uh, what's happening now. That this was the moment where mm -hmm. this massive shift started happening in our food system. Not only from how we grow our food, how we transport our food, but really what we put on our menus. So good. So hold that thought because we want to talk about what's next and innovation. But Matt, yeah. you're doing it. Yeah. You are doing it big time, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were just talking this morning about, you know, Mean Greens Cafe, and mm -hmm. we're going into our 12th year of mm. a 100% plant-based 
operation on a college campus in Texas. Wow. You know, in beef, in beef, Texas. Con- in Texas, in beef country, <laughs> in beef country, you know, be- so. Yeah, not just Texas, but beef, beef country, because yeah. you're just right there at Fort Worth. Right, yeah. yeah. And, and, and just, you know, as a, as a whole organization in UNT Dining Services, and, you know, we've made that commitment, you know, for, you know, plant-based dining and our relationship with MCURC and, and, and myself being co-chair of the Executive Chefs Committee and doing these research, research projects and whatnot, you know, we've made that commitment and, 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 you know, of course, you know, we're dealing with college students and what do college students love? Burgers, right? Yes. They grew up with burgers. It's an iconic, you know, it's an iconic, you know, an iconic food, um, a food. So, mm-hmm. you know, uh, you know, we've got, we've got near 8,000 freshmen coming in in November, right? you know, they're, they're dealing with college life and stuff like that. So for us to be able to have a comfort food like burgers within the organization and, and you know, uh, at our uh, newest concept, Eagle Landing, right, we have, mm-hmm. we do the blended burger, we do the, the, the 100% plant-based um, black bean burger, Mean Greens, we do, you know, we do a burger uh, with, uh, with seitan uh, and whatnot. And then, of course, at our um, athletics um, department, uh, department, we do a, a turkey, what we call a performance bur- burger, which has turkey, um, spinach and some grains in it, you know, mm-hmm. so, so we can keep in the, you know, keep these athletes um, at top performance, you know. Especially because they're eating 21 at a time, ex- right? Yeah, exactly, yes. yeah, exa- exactly, <laughs> yes. you know. But, but for us, it's all about innovation. It's all about engagement. You know, we mm-hmm. need to keep these students coming into our dining halls. You know, we need to be able to, um, you know, engage them on a daily basis and really pique their interest, you know. I mean, college students are the most savvy consumers right now, you know. And we're building, we're building their, um, their food habits and their food, you know, to get out into the real world. So, mm-hmm. you know, we need to be on top of it, you know, whether it's internet, you know, in, introducing international flavors for burgers, you know, seasoning them internationally, you know, um, a- Asian cuisine is really, you know, really popular right now. So a kimchi burger, you know, you, you, ma- you make a, a blend, you know, with, with Asian flavors and you put kimchi on it and they, they go bananas for it. Mm-hmm. You know, so that's the kind of, that's the kind of work we're doing in, 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 in colleges and universities right now is, is really kind of setting them up and kind of showing them, you know, it doesn't have to always be the beef burger. It can be right. a blended burger. You know, you can add lentils to your blend. You can add mushrooms mm-hmm. to your blend. You know, you can, you know, uh, go into the mush- down the mushroom thing, lion's mane, right? Right. You know, we can use a lion's mane mushroom and we can flatten it out and it, it ta- you know, it takes on the, you know, characteristics of, of, of meat, you know, mm-hmm. so. Or, or crab, you know, oh, yeah, we did that great crab cake. Right, exactly, yeah. delicious crab yeah, cake. Yeah, exactly. Yes. So, you know, the biggest thing for us is just making sure that we're innovating and we're kind of teaching them, like, mm-hmm. it doesn't always have to be meat. It can be a blend of meat. It mm-hmm. can be no meat. You know, and it can still taste good, and we can still execute it in a way that tastes great for them. One of the things I love, and it goes a little bit along with the question to Vior, is that what you just mentioned, the kimchi burger, you tend to really focus on naming Mm -hmm. and really drawing that student in to the burger, not about it just being beef or being a blend or being a, a turkey blend, but instead by the build and by the naming. So the kimchi burger is a perfect example. Do you feel that it's important to call out what that burger is or more the description of the build? I think it goes, it goes into the description, mm-hmm. right? It, right? Right. They, they want to know. They want, they, mm-hmm. you, you, you get them in, you, you mm-hmm. hook them, they try it, and they're like, oh, you got to put that on the menu every day. And it's right. like, well, mm-hmm. well, well, we'll get something different for you. Yes. You know, just wait. Just wait, yes. right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Just so, wait. Yeah, so it has a lot to do with engagement, engagement, mm-hmm. student engagement, and really, you know, piquing their interest. And, and, and you know, it, when I got into, you know, colleges and, and universities, I didn't, I didn't think it was, yeah, I didn't, th- what I got into, I was like, wow, these kids are really savvy and the, right. they know what they're doing now. So, oh, so yeah, much, yeah. so much. Yeah. yeah, with social media and stuff like mm-hmm. that, yeah, mm-hmm. they, they yeah. got you. In so. lots of ways. So what has been the biggest hurdle, either in developing your burger, um, marketing it, or just getting people to come and try it? Right. I think probably um, I was reading a, a number of statistics about hamburgers to prepare, and uh, a, a fairly high number, I want to say well over 40, said that they don't want a blended burger or a plant-based burger. They want a traditional hamburger. 
right? And, and if not, they wanted something completely different, right? So it wasn't sort of a, a morphed burger. It was either this or nothing, right? So what, is, what has been your hurdle, um, and how have you solved it? Because you're, we have three successful models here. Sure. sure. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I didn't know who that was going to. I didn't know who uh, the well, fastest. The fastest. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Let me let me just jump <laughs> right. in and say I see the success in that statistic in the sense that that means sixty percent of people are open to a burger with a difference, right? So that's a huge win. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, love that. Yes, yeah, Spike. Yeah, you, you know, the, you know, I've come to find that the. You know, the hamburger is much more of a brand uh, than actually an ingredient, right? Right. So, and I think that's what we're fighting against is that people really just associate beef with with a hamburger, right? And and I get that, right? We've been eating this way forever. You know, some of the challenges, uh, you, you, like you pointed out, uh, for us uh, from a taste perspective, um, is that we're up against. Uh, you know, years and years of, of bad vegetarian and bad vegan food and, and Boca burgers and, and things that just uh, didn't quite hit the palate right and, and, and didn't uh, make it feel indulgent. So I think first and foremost is taste. And, you know, we have, at Plant Burger, we have massive initiative and, and, and uh, you know, we're setting out to do so many things and we have all sorts of amazing data points, for instance, like, we use 92% uh, less land, 95% less water, you know, 98% less carbon emissions, you know, compared to a beef burger if you eat our burger. So if you look at those numbers, it's kind of like, okay, this makes sense. But people really aren't into numbers when they're, they're eating food. It has to taste really delicious. So for us, o overcoming the, the taste part um, is where we win. And, you know, we're a group of chefs um, at, at Plant Burger. So... Uh, we know textures, we, and you know, like I said, I'm also flexitarian, so I know what a burger should taste like. And um, you know, we figured with the innovation in the space, if we could just make this thing toasty, indulgent, melty, um, we win, right? And we have something called the Plant Believe It Challenge at, at Plant Burger, where we invited customers to kind of come in, buy burgers, we'd give them a couple for free, uh, and they would be able to take these burgers home and, and feed them to their friends or family, and then after the meal, be like, aha, you know, like it's, it's vegan. And, you know, you'd see these, uh, you know, on Instagram, you're talking about chill. So you'd see all these videos that we're posting where people couldn't believe it. Um, you know, we had one lady when we first opened our first uh, Silver Spring location, uh, an elderly woman. She had come in our restaurant two, three times uh, a week. And we finally, you know, on, I think it was like, you know, after a month, we, you know, uh, our marketing director went up and thanked her. He was like, thank you so much for supporting the plant-based movement. Uh, you know, we're, we're so happy to serve you. And she looked like really puzzled. She kind of looked up, um, like, he, he had, like he was a monster. He was like, what are you talking about? She's like, well, you know, this is Plant Burger. Thank you for the support. I've noticed that you were here. Um, and she had no clue she was eating a plant-based burger the entire <laughs> time. She actually had to have employees come out and, and, say no to like, really, this is 100% made out of plants, and she mm -hmm. still comes to this day. And um, So that, from a taste perspective, is something mm -hmm. we're up against. Um, the other thing we're up against is that our supply chain um, isn't as uh, hearty or healthy as the rest. Uh, and what I mean by that is, if you open a, you know, a burger restaurant, you have um, you know, a, a meat burger restaurant, you have um, a beef burger restaurant, you have hundreds of purveyors uh, to kind of choose from, right? Uh, which make it a lot easier to drive your price down, and and and, and you know, and for us, it, we only have two, three purveyors that we can get our burger from. So, and there's inflation. So, you know, we have a movement. We have to make things taste good. We understand what we're up against, but we also have to be profitable so we can hang around for a while to survive to really, you know, see this to the to the end. And uh, so that's some of the challenges. And then, you know, and then. You have the, the meat industry and the lobbyists, I'm on Capitol Hill, so I get a lot of this, um, that uh, witness what happened to the dairy industry, which got completely, uh, you know, killed by plant-based milks, uh, you know, oat milk, almond milk, and, and uh, you know, they don't want to see themselves in that spot either. So you're getting a lot of pushback from uh, meat lobbyists, uh, you're getting a lot of uh, paid influence out there uh, uh, to debunk the plant-based movement. Um, so you put, you know, so we have a fight, uh, you know, a, a long fight ahead of us, but at the end of the day, what we believe, to get back to my first point, is that if we put something in front of you, 
that doesn't, uh, that meets the occasion, uh, meets the taste, the indulgence, uh, and, you know, is better for the planet and better for you, I think that's a win-win, and I think people will start to get that. Right. Well, and there's also been so much of a, of, of a backlash with just people saying, I, I want real I want real plant in my plant burger, right? So yes. again, you've had to roll with some of the highs and lows with that, which is one of the reasons, Matt, that you all have determined you want to do everything in-house. in-house yeah. And because your students really focus on that. Yeah, it's about it's about doing it in-house. It's about, you know, coming up with it. You know, if we can't if we can't make it, we don't serve it. That's kind mm-hmm. of the philosophy and, and whatnot. And 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 really what it comes down to it's execution, right? We're you know, we're chefs. You know, we, we either went into the industry and we learned or we went, at, we went to school and stuff like that. The biggest thing is you have to make it taste good. Mm-hmm. You, have to cook it, you have to cook fundamentally, right? It's about building flavors. It's about you just don't throw everything in a pot mm-hmm. and come back 30 minutes later and boom, mm-hmm. here you go, right. you know? Yes. So that's, that's the biggest thing, you <laughs> right. know? And, and on a college, like on a, a, a college campus, it's like, hey, come in, try it. Mm-hmm. If you like it, great. If you don't, cool. Yeah, you know, you so. can order something else. Exactly, it. yeah. yeah and sure. it's all about education. It's all about right. engaging with these students and talking to them, and mm-hmm. and really just really just making sure that they understand, mm-hmm. you know, understand the health benefits and 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 whatnot, and and mm-hmm. just moving them forward. So yeah. Yeah. nutritious, delicious, sustainable. Stable. Yeah. Um, you had mentioned, no, mm-hmm. yeah, and, and suspicious. <laughs> yeah. You had mentioned, you know, some of the plant-based burgers of your. Um, you know, what I've always felt, and many of us have had these conversations is unfortunately many of those were built in a very um, what's been taken out of it. So again, Boca Burger was a delicious burger, but it was built usually on a dry, tasteless bun with alfalfa sprouts. And I mean, there was nothing that was indulgent. And Fior, that's a completely different tack. You, I mean, that winning burger, you had this beautiful avocado and goat cheese, and it was so indulgent. So you took a different tack with that, an indulgent yet better burger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're on. You're good. I don't know. Oh, Here, yeah. That's what we wanted to do, make everything in-house, to your point, and mm-hmm. then to your point as well, having an option uh, for people who didn't want to eat meat. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, it has to taste good. They said it. Mm-hmm. The flavor first. That's right. Yeah, good. The other thing I just want to, you know, I, like I said, I'm a flexitarian, so I'm mm-hmm. not a, against meat, but, um, you know, there, there's multiple battle, you know, multiple multiple battles that we're fighting here, right? One is getting back to more plant-based foods, just in general, mm-hmm. home right. cooked foods, vegetables, really highlighting that. The other one is that we we have a lot of people to feed, right, right uh, in the world. So processed foods need to get reinvented also mm-hmm. to be better, right? So, you know. When Beyond Meat first hit, hit the market, it was highly successful, and then start, pe- people started reading the label ingredient, and there was a lot of pushback, right? So it's really up to these, these companies to continue working on their products. Evolve l- them. Evolve them mm-hmm. and make them even with less ingredients, which Beyond Meat is doing, right? So it's kind of a two-prong approach mm-hmm. here. Um, I'm not a preacher, uh, and I'm also a realistic of... of hey, everyone needs to become plant-based or or vegetarian or vegan. That is is just a reality that will never happen on this Mm -hmm. planet. But what we can do is we can shift a little bit more to a better balance, right? Mm -hmm. Better balance for the planet, a better balance for yourself, and a better uh, uh, balance for the economy, right? Right. Uh, So... So I think like we all here represent different facets of this, which I think is you know great on you guys to putting us on a panel together. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's important that we we kind of all succeed. And you know, one question I have for you actually, uh, if you don't mind, uh, I can ask a question. Was he can only answer in about thirty seconds? But okay, good, okay, great. Good question. Then a quick answer. Good. Yes. <laughs> you know, I was just wondering because you know at, you know at a school it's so important. You know, the work that you're doing I think is great. Has there been any data points to see? Um, you know how more productive students are, I guess, within the school by eating healthier, feeling less sluggish, or, you know, I just didn't know if that existed because I find it fascinating. So that. That's a great question. Yeah. And actually, I think that should be a research project for the MCURC. I like and, that. And it's part of the, um, a part of research that we do. Mm-hmm. That, that might be a, that might be a good, yes. a good research. That'd be yeah. huge. Yeah. yeah. That'd be huge. But, I, but we've had students, health, but right? we have had students that have said, mm-hmm. I feel much better eating 
in 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 this in this dining hall than I do with the other ones as yeah. well. You know, yeah. so. Awesome. Yeah, because yeah. good for the body isn't just preventing disease of tomorrow. It's feeling good today, right. and, and you all are doing that. I feel good today. Do you feel good, Beth? Yes, but I'm looking forward to having a burger okay. of some <laughs> variety. Yes. I, I hope that's what's in the bento boxes for lunch. <laughs> we can only pray. That's right. Awesome. So, so looking forward, where do we go? I have an idea of... <laughs> Doing um, your kind of concept at, at the at the college, I'd I'd like to see um, things made in house with real plants. Personally, we had a big push for Impossible and Beyond, and we did that. Um, and now it's kind of going the opposite way. People mm -hmm. want to see maybe a portobello or some lentils. Mm -hmm. um, things we can like help that. you with that. Yes. Yeah, perfect. That's awesome. Like 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 we like we say at the college. We're in the business of whole, of whole foods, right? right? You know, using whole ingredients and, mm -hmm. you know, so. Good. Yeah. So we're going to get kicked off the stage. We got to go. All right. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you to our <laughs> panelists so much. What a great conversation, and uh, there were so many questions coming in through Slido. I realized we didn't get a time to uh, much time to get the, the audience Q and A, but our panelists will be sticking around uh, over the, over this break that we're heading into. So hopefully, uh, this this conversation generated some good fodder for discussion around burgers. What you all are doing? Talk to one another and and work through some of those challenges and questions. Find our panelists to continue those conversations. So we have just a short networking break now, so we invite you downstairs um, for some refreshments, some networking sponsored by the National Honey Board, and we'll see you back here at 10.30 for our next general session. So hopefully uh, this, this conversation generated some good fodder for discussion around burgers, what you all are doing. Talk to one another and, and work through some of those challenges and questions. Find our panelists to continue those conversations. So we have just a short networking break now. So we invite you downstairs um, for some refreshments, some networking sponsored by the National Honey Board. And we'll see you back here at 1030 for our next general session.